This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning, everybody. I am Joanna Albala. I am the manager of the science education program at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And I'd like to welcome you this morning to Science on Saturday, which is brought to you in conjunction with the Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District. And before we get started, did everybody enjoy that first look, that sneak peek into the lab? Wasn't that cool? Um, we are going to go over some housekeeping rules. So first of all, in case of an emergency, the ushers will safely lead us through the exits into the front of the building. So please follow all ushers' instructions. And also, if you take a moment to silence your cell phone so we can hear the presentation clearly. And at the very end of the presentation, we'll take some questions. So we'd like you all to stay and hear the questions. And if your question doesn't get answered um, at the very end, you can come down and speak with the presenters at the apron of the stage. So this year's theme for Science on Saturday is Women in STEM. Who's come already this, uh, this year to hear our other presenters? Oh, that's awesome. So we've heard about science, and we've heard about technology, and today we're going to talk about engineering. And what better way than to talk about the world's most powerful and energetic laser at the National Ignition Facility. So our presenters today are going to tell you all about the NIF. And Dr. Tammy Ma is an experimental physicist at the lab who works on NIF. She got her Bachelor of Science degree in aerospace engineering at Caltech, and then she went on to get both her master's and her PhD in aerospace engineering um, at UC San Diego. And she works as a group leader in fusion, doing experiments on uh, the National Ignition Facility. And so helping her out today, we have Tom Scheffler. He's a teacher at Granada High School, and he's been teaching physics and engineering there for the last 16 years. He got his bachelor's degree in physics and applied math from Western Michigan University. And then he went on to get his master's in um, astronomy and um, aerospace as well. So we have a terrifically fabulous team to talk with you today. But wait, there's one more thing. Just this Thursday, Dr. Ma was awarded the uh, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. And this is the US government's highest honor for early career scientists to use their award to help facilitate and propel their independent scientific research. It is awesome. And she gets to go to Washington, D.C., and hopefully meet the President of the United States to receive her award. Now, isn't that supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? So without further ado, Dr. Ma and Mr. Scheffler. Good job. Good morning. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us this Saturday to talk about a little science. Uh, like Joanna said, my name is Tammy. I'm an experimental physicist at the lab. And it is really such a thrill for me to be talking to you today. Because not so long ago, I was actually sitting exactly where you are sitting. I grew up in Fremont, and my parents brought me to Science on Saturday when I was in high school. And hearing some of the presentations, hearing about some of the science just really inspired me. I thought it was absolutely amazing. So it's really a thrill for me to get to be a part of the lab today, but also to get to talk to you. Now, I was also incredibly fortunate. I had some really amazing science teachers, like Mr. Tom Scheffler. So we're really excited to be talking today. So what are we going to talk about? Well, first of all, we're going to go over some of the energy usage of the world and talk about why we need more energy. And then we're going to talk about how the sun makes energy using this process called fusion. And then back here on Earth, in fact, here at Livermore, we use lasers to make fusion. So we get to talk about all of that today. Right now, the world uses 
13 terawatts of power. What does that mean? How much is 13 terawatts of power? Well, if you've taken advanced math, maybe physics, you've learned some of the Latin prefixes. Tera means 10 to the 12. So 13 terawatts is 13 with 12 zeros after it. It's a really big number. But what does that actually mean uh, in, in terms of some daily life items that we might better understand? Well, 13 terawatts of power could run 670 billion compact fluorescent bulbs. So currently, the population of the world is just above 7 billion. So this is equivalent to each human being on Earth turning on 100 light bulbs at exactly the same time. If we think in terms of laptops, 13 terawatts would run 300 billion laptops. So that's about 50 laptops for each human on Earth. <laughs> in terms of refrigerators, 24 billion. So that's three to four refrigerators full of food for each human being. And finally, smartphones. How many of you guys have an iPhone or maybe an Android phone? You guys have one, right? 13 terawatts of power would mean that every human being on Earth is running 350 smartphones simultaneously at exactly the same time. But here's the rub. The world will actually need more energy. So if we look at this image, it's a satellite image taken by NASA of the Earth at night. Um, it's actually a composite of a whole bunch of different images. Um, what you can see is the Earth lit up where there's large populations, where there's cities, and people are turning on their lights, right, to light up the night sky. So you see that the US is quite bright, particularly on the coast. Europe is bright, and China and India are really bright too. But China and India are actually not that bright given their population density. So we know in the coming years, as technology continues to advance, we develop new electronics that require electricity to run. And as the human population continues to increase, and importantly, these developing countries decide they want a standard of living similar to what we have in the US. It turns out we consume a whole bunch of energy. So we know that in the coming decades, the amount of energy we will need to power the world will continue to grow. Now another way of looking at this is by looking at this plot of energy usage over time. What's our historical energy usage look like? Well, the y-axis, that vertical axis, is energy in exajoules per year. Joules is a unit of energy. Exa is another Latin prefix for 10 to the 18. So it's one with 18 zeros after it. And then on that uh, horizontal axis is year. And you can see that over time, our energy usage is definitely growing. And you can imagine if we extrapolate this chart out to 2020, 2030, where's that line going to continue to go? It's just going to continue going up, right? So what's really fun is actually we can go back in history and actually correlate some of the trends we see in energy usage with certain historical events. So first of all, uh, in the early 1800s, uh, we had the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution was a period of enormous growth because we found out that instead of relying on human labor to manufacture, we could turn to machines and we could turn to factories. And what do we need in order to get those machines and factories to run? We need an energy source, right? In addition, during the Industrial Revolution was when steam transport uh, really became ubiquitous. Uh, steam transport in terms of uh, trains, ships, boats, and in order to get those things to run, you also need a source of energy. Now, in the 1920s was when Ford's Model T was introduced. This was the automobile um, that was available to the average family because it became affordable. Now, in order to run all our automobiles, what do we need? We also need fuel. So then you can see that our energy usage starts to grow. And then there's that very interesting bend right around 1950. What happened there? Well, that marked the period that was the end of World War II. It was a period of relative peace, relative prosperity, and human population boomed. And with more humans on Earth, we also needed more energy. And then something very near and dear to all our hearts, the personal computer was introduced in the 1970s. And with that, you can see that the um, energy usage continues to accelerate upwards. So how have we actually provided 
uh, the energy that we need over time. Well, starting in the 1800s, we actually didn't have a lot of options. Uh, we primarily relied on biofuels, or wood. So we burned wood to keep ourselves warm, to cook our food. And you can see that over time, our reliance on wood hasn't really changed. The, the width of that bar stays pretty much constant. And that's because there's only so many forests that you can actually cut down to burn for wood. Now, as the Industrial Revolution uh, progressed, um, you can see that we started using more and more coal to run those factories and machines. And our reliance on coal continues to grow through to today. Now, with the introduction of the automobile, we started relying on oil. We needed oil to run all our cars. And then at that kink, at that bend, right around the 1950s, and as, as our standard of living started to increase, and we all wanted to keep our homes warm, warm year-round, we started relying on more natural gas. And then uh, we built dams. Uh, these are hydroelectric power. So what you're going to do is build a dam across the river. And as the water rushes through it, you're going to turn generators, turn turbines, and get electricity out. And we built a lot of these dams in the 1950s, 1960s. And you can see that since then, though, the width of that bar hasn't really changed. And that's because there's only so many rivers we can actually dam. And finally, to fulfill the rest of our need, we rely on nuclear power. Nuclear, in the conventional sense, fission power plants um, that are able to actually provide quite a large base load, and we can build them close to cities. So if I look at this plot, what really stands out to me is that even today, the majority of our energy is provided to us through coal, oil, and natural gas, right? Well, what are coal, oil, and natural gas? They are fossil fuels, and fossil fuels are carbon-based. What that means is that over millions of years, organic material, material that contain carbon, so uh, dead dinosaurs, organic plants, um, uh, dead animals, uh, they died, they were buried deep down in the earth and pressurized over millions of years and turned into fossil fuels that we can actually dig out today and use. But the interesting thing is we're actually burning 10 million years worth of carbon fossil fuel each year. So it's not difficult to imagine that it won't actually take us very long to run out. In one year, we're able to use up 10 million years worth of work that the Earth put into making these fossil fuels for us. Now, the other thing about fossil fuels are that they can affect the climate. So this is a diagram from NASA that tracks over time the changing temperature of the Earth between 1884 through 2015. And you can see that as we get closer and closer to today, you're going to start seeing more and more red on the map. So the average surface temperature of the Earth is increasing as we burn more fossil fuels. We're trapping that carbon in the atmosphere, and it's actually heating up the Earth. So we know that fossil fuels are dirty. We know that fossil fuels are affecting the climate. And we have a limited resource. So what are some of our future non-carbon energy sources? Well, first of all, there's hydroelectric. We talked a little bit about this already. These, is, these are dams um, in rivers. There's geothermal. What geothermal is, is you dig way down deep underground, um, uh, several miles into the magma of the Earth, which is really, really hot. And you're going to release that heat as steam and use that steam to run generators. Now, the issue with geothermal is there's only a few places in the world where you can actually harness that energy. Solar thermal is really cool. Solar thermal, this is uh, an example of one of those plants uh, in New Mexico. And the idea here is you're going to take huge reflectors, basically mirrors, and reflect the light from the sun all up to one place, the single tower that contains a molten salt. And that salt is going to get really hot and then generate steam. Now, the issue with solar thermal is you need a lot of land, a lot of space to set up your reflectors, and you need a lot of sunlight. So where is there a lot of space, a lot of sun? Well, typically the deserts. And the issue is people don't live in the deserts. People live in cities, typically pretty far away from the deserts. So transport of that electricity is an issue. And then there's photovoltaic. This is probably an energy source that's quite familiar to many of you, because you might have solar panels up on your roofs. 
and wind power, wind as in the, the wind turbines like we might have up on Altamont Pass. Now, photovoltaic and wind are really nice because you can bring them close to where your humans are living, um, but the issue is they also take up a decent amount of room uh, to generate their electricity, but the other issue is they are intermittent, right? At night, you don't have the sun, so you can't get any electricity out of your solar panels. And with wind, the wind has to be blowing in exactly the right direction at the right range of speeds in order to turn those turbines that you get power out. And finally, there's nuclear. As I said, nuclear does have the capability to provide a lot of energy for us. However, um, we're often concerned uh, with nuclear meltdowns and the radioactivity associated with fission power plants. So I'm going to send it over to Tom now, who's going to do a little demo for you of different energy sources. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank and introduce uh, Parker Turk. He is my star. Uh, Principles of Engineering and AP Physics student, and he has uh, graciously volunteered his time to uh, build three different uh, toy cars that demonstrate different ways that uh, you can uh, power devices. So let's start with the uh, battery-powered car. So this is powered by uh, two AAA batteries. So if you were to go down to Toys R Us and buy a, a toy car, this is probably how it would typically be powered. Just like Lightning McQueen. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, AAA batteries are, are nice, but uh, they're not exactly the most renewable energy source. So probably the, the cleanest, most renewable energy source we have at our disposal is solar. So we have a solar-powered car right here. And we also have a solar simulator. So harnessing the energy of light to turn it into the energy of motion, which is totally awesome. But what if you wish to take advantage of an energy source that is uh, as renewable and as clean as solar, but you want to use it, say, at night when the sun is rather dim? Well, one thing that you can do is you can uh, harvest solar energy during the day. One way to do that is with something called a hydrogen fuel cell. So these three little uh, blue devices on top of this car are called hydrogen fuel cells, and the fuel is just ordinary distilled water, H2O. And what I did this morning uh, is I charged each of these fuel cells by hooking them up to uh, a solar panel, shine the light on it, and what happened was the energy from the light went into the water and it broke up the hydrogen and the oxygen. And you start with H2O, and you take the hydrogen, move it over here, oxygen over here. So we have hydrogen gas and oxygen gas in these little reservoirs in the bottom of the fuel cells. Well, if it takes energy to pry apart the hydrogen and the oxygen, if you allow that process to reverse, and you allow the hydrogen and oxygen to reform, you can obtain energy from that reaction, and that's how the fuel cells work. So let's see how that goes. So the nice thing about uh, using a hydrogen fuel cell is the byproduct that you're left with after you're done obtaining the energy is water, which is about the cleanest byproduct you can imagine. Now, uh, we're not quite ready to, uh, to take this to the NASCAR circuit, but uh, I think you can see there's a lot of promise here. Thank you so much, Tom. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of the efficiency of different energy sources. But as you saw, we needed a pretty big solar panel to run that little itty bitty car, right? Imagine how big a solar panel you might need to run the car you drive or your parents drive or even to power homes in cities. So the question really then is, is there another idea? So as scientists, uh, sometimes we have to think really hard. We sit in our offices, scratching our heads. Um, sometimes we have to be really creative. But it turns out that sometimes the answer is actually right in front of you. What if we could build a miniature sun here on Earth? 
and harness that energy. How cool would that be? <laughs> I agree, amazing. Um, the sun and the stars are powered by this process called fusion. Now the basic concept behind fusion is very simple. You're going to take a light element, uh, two atoms of a light element in fact, and you're going to get them hot and dense and you're going to squeeze them together until you get a heavier element out. And with that comes some energy. So what's the lightest element on Earth? Hydrogen. And in fact, we're going to start with two isotopes of hydrogen. Now, isotopes mean you're still going to have the one proton and one electron that make it a hydrogen. But in addition, you're going to have varying number of neutrons. So in deuterium, you're going to have one neutron. And in tritium, you're going to have two neutrons. We're going to fuse them together. And then on the other side, we get helium. Now, because that helium weighs a little bit less than those original two hydrogen atoms, that mass is going to get converted into energy. Well, how do you do that? Well, we're going to stick it into a very powerful equation that you might have heard of before, E equals mc squared. So again, if you weigh that deuterium tritium, it weighs a little bit of something. It goes into this reaction called fusion, and on the other end we get helium, and it's going to weigh a little bit less. Now that differential in mass, we're going to put into our equation as the m, and we're going to multiply that m by c squared, where c is the speed of light. And we all know that that is an enormous number, right? So m times c squared, you're going to get a tremendous amount of energy out. And that is why we think this guy is so cool, because he figured this out over 100 years ago, e equals mc squared. And now I'm going to send it back to Tom, who's going to do a little demo called cookie dough fusion. Well, this particular a aspect of fusion always seems so counterintuitive and, and difficult to grasp for, for me, the idea that you can take uh, these two nuclei that weigh a certain amount, put them together, and all of a sudden they weigh less. That, that mass is somehow lost and turned into energy. It would be like if you had a brick house that weighed less than all of the bricks that went into to building it. That just seems so counterintuitive. So we have a little bit of a demo that uh, is kind of an analogy that might uh, help this idea make a little bit more intuitive sense. So we're going to simulate a couple of uh, atoms here. These atoms are going to be made of the uh, very uh, rare material known as uh, Nestle Tolhousium. So here's one Nestle Tolhousium atom. Here's a second Nestle Tolhousium atom. And Parker, if you could come on out and put these on the scale and tell me their mass. Fifty-one point two seven grams. And now let's put them in the microwave and let's put them in there for about 30 seconds. So what we're going to do is we're going to be introducing a little bit of energy to our two atoms. And we're going to see if this little bit of energy that the microwave is providing will inspire some fusion to take place. Now disclaimer, even though we use the word nuke to describe the action of cooking with a microwave, there is actually nothing nuclear going on. Uh, this is a perfectly safe household appliance. Um, what we're going to be doing here is if we lose a little bit of mass, technically it's going to be some water vapor escaping from the cookie dough, but we're going to pretend that it's mass lost to, uh, to a fusion process. So let's take a look at how many atoms we have now. So take a look. We started with one atom. We now have two, or one, I'm sorry, we started with two atoms. We now have one. They have fused together. And tell us, what is the mass of our new atom? Fifty point six eight. So notice we have lost some mass. So we have lost 0 0.59 grams of mass. So imagine this 0 0.59 grams was converted into energy via E equals mc squared. So here's our m. Now when you use the formula E equals mc squared, 
you want to have your mass in kilograms. So I'm going to scoot this over three uh, decimal places. So I can say m is equal to 0 0.00059 kilograms. Now I can use the formula E equals mc squared. My mass is now known. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the eighth, or 300 million meters per second. So if I plug these numbers together, I get 5.31 times 10 to the 13 joules of energy. So this is approximately 5 with 13 zeros after it, joules of energy, more than enough to cook all the cookies that you could possibly eat. of energy is actually equivalent to about 5,000 tons of TNT, just that little bit of mass loss. If instead of cookie dough, we had been using deuterium tritium fuel, uh, the fuel that we need for fusion. So like we said, instead of using cookie dough, we're actually using hydrogen, right? But where do we find hydrogen? Well, H2O, right? And it really turns out that water is the fuel of life. The planet is covered by 70% seawater. And in fact, uh, deuterium, one of those isotopes of hydrogen that we need in our fusion reaction, is naturally occurring in seawater. So all we have to do is go scoop it out. So fusion fuel is actually very plentiful, right? We can get it from seawater. And it turns out that a single pound of fusion fuel is equal to 5,000 barrels of oil, which is equal to three and a half million pounds of coal. So what would you rather have, a pound of hydrogen or three and a half million pounds of coal? And potentially, this means that we have fusion fuel for 30 million years. Now, fusion energy is attractive for many other reasons as well. First of all, it's safe. In order to initiate a fusion reaction, you first have to get your deuterium and tritium really hot so that they can fuse together. And in order to get them hot, you have to first provide it with some energy source. So if you ever wanted your fusion reaction to stop, all you have to do is cut off your initial energy source. Fusion energy is sustainable. We know how we can get the fuel that we need for fusion, and we can do it without harming the environment. Energy security. If we can demonstrate fusion as a viable energy source, no longer will we have to rely on foreign oil imports. And then baseload. A fusion power plant would be very similar in scale to a coal-powered plant or a fission power plant, easily be able to feed the energy needs of a city the size of San Francisco. Fusion is carbon-free. The only byproducts of fusion are helium, so no carbon anywhere. And finally, no geologic storage. There's no enrichment, no reprocessing, no high-level radioactive waste associated with it. So at the National Ignition Facility, the NIF at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, we are working to build our own miniature sun. And the NIF is actually the world's largest and most energetic laser system. It's actually the size of three football fields side by side in a building that is 10 stories tall. So I bet you didn't know that just in your backyard, your very own backyard, is the world's largest, most energetic laser system. That is pretty cool. And what the NIF does is it's not just one laser beam. It's 192 separate laser beams. And what we're going to do is concentrate the energy of all 192 laser beams into a millimeter cubed into a tiny target that's about the size of a pencil eraser. And we have an image of it right, to, right there on the bottom left. What you're looking at is a whole ROM. It's going to be a gold canister. It's um, a little soup can with holes on either end. And right in the middle, we're going to hold our fuel pellet, that capsule, right in the middle. And the process we're going to use is called inertial confinement fusion. ICF, to bring star power to Earth. 
But whereas the sun is about a million miles across, the experiment that we're going to do in the lab is on a scale of two one thousandths of an inch. That's about half the diameter of a human hair. So how do we do this? Well, here's our recipe to build a small star. First, we're going to take a hollow spherical plastic capsule. It's about two millimeters in diameter. This is about the size of a small pea. And what we're going to do is fill it with deuterium and tritium. And then we're going to place that fuel capsule in the middle of that whole rum. That whole rum is that gold canister that's about the size of a pencil eraser. And then we're going to focus the light from the biggest laser in the world onto the inside of the whole rom. So the NIF is 192 laser beams. We're going to take half of them, 96 of them, send them um, through one laser entrance hole, and then the other 96 beams through the other hole. And they're not going to hit the capsule directly. They're going to hit the inside wall. And what happens is we're going to generate very, very energetic x-rays with that laser light. And those x-rays are going to compress the capsule. So what we need to do is get the capsule to densities greater, greater than 100 times solid lead, so really, really dense, temperatures of 100 million degrees Celsius. This is hotter, actually, than the center of the sun for one billionth of a second in order to make our own miniature star here on Earth. So it sounds pretty easy, right? In fact, ICF capsules basically have to shrink in volume by greater than 40,000 times. Now, to give you an idea of that scale, it's like taking a basketball and squeezing it down to the size of a marble, and you're going to do it all in less than a microsecond and keep it round the entire time. Now, this is really, really challenging because you can imagine if you're trying to squeeze a balloon in between your fingers, right? Everywhere it can, that balloon is going to push back out. So this is what we have to fight. This is one of our big challenges, that we stay round the entire time that we're doing this compression. So now we're going to do another little demo for you. It's called Lasers on Target. And Parker's going to help me set up. And I'm going to bring out here a scale model of our target. This target is actually 20 times larger in size than the real target. Um, the whole ROM is right here in the center. Uh, this is a cylinder. The rest of this is hardware so that we're able to hold the target in the center of the target chamber. Typically, the capsule sits right there in the middle, but we've taken it out for the sake of the demo. And what we're going to do is set the target right here. And Parker is going to go on the other side of the stage. And he's going to have a laser pointer. And he's going to demonstrate to you how easy or hard it is to actually shoot that laser into the target. So go for it, Parker. Is he getting it through? Is the laser on? That's a challenge. One. All right, nice. One, hold it steady, hold it steady. What about the other one? Can we get it through? Oh, there we go. Now imagine that with not two lasers, but 192 with them. And instead of Parker standing on the other side of the stage, Parker is standing a mile away. And the target is actually about this size. So that's a scale model of the whole rum. And you can maybe see right in the middle of this little red pellet that is our fuel capsule. So that is the challenge of the NIF. So um, because this is a very complex project, a complex piece of engineering, what we're going to do um, is show you a movie about how a laser shot on the NIF actually happens. So we're first going to start in the control room. And this control room uh, is mod modeled on the NASA control room. So now we're going to start by energizing the laser. The laser is actually born in the master oscillator room at about a nanojoule level, so really low energy. And we're going to shape it. And then we're going to take that one laser pulse and split it 48 ways. And it goes into the preamplifier chain. And there it's going to get a little bit of energy up to the joule level. 
And then we're going to take each one of those beams and split it four ways, so that now we have 192 separate lasers. These lasers are now going to bounce back and forth multiple times through this uh, huge facility the size of three football fields. And you can see we've now expanded up in space the size of the lasers so that there are squares that are about 30 centimeters on a side. And the reason we have to do this is because there's so much energy in those lasers that we have to spread out that energy so it doesn't damage the optics as it's traveling through. So now all 192 laser beams are going to approach the target chamber. That's that blue ball in the middle. It's 10 meters in diameter, so 30 feet. Half of our laser beams get set upwards, half downwards. And it looks like they're all traveling at their, same, uh, at their own speed right now, right? But watch this. They all sync up. They're all going to frequency convert to blue light. And now they're incident on our target. So half of those laser beams are going to come in through the hole in the top of the hole ROM, half on the bottom. They hit the inside wall of that hole ROM, get it really hot, and start creating this flux of x-rays that are going to compress the capsule. The capsule is going to get really hot, really dense, until we can make our own miniature star in the laboratory. So if that big blue sphere that you saw in the movie looked familiar. It might have been because it itself is a pretty big star. Um, um, when they filmed Star Trek Into Darkness, they did come to the NIF. Um, and the uh, target area is actually the engine control room. And that big blue sphere served as the warp core for the Starship Enterprise. So it was, yeah, it was pretty cool for us, too. <laughs> so the question is, Right now, we've been able to make parts of that star, uh, small pieces of the star. And the big question is, when will we be able to get a star burning well enough that we get more energy out than we initially put in by E equals mc squared, right? So how close are we? Well, if we think about our challenge, like climbing a mountain, where the elevation we get to is the energy that we actually produce, then when the NIF was built, we were at the bottom of this mountain. We hadn't even started climbing yet. And we found that when we started experiments in 2009, when the facility was completed, we needed to get 100 times more energy into our fuel than we were getting in order to get to E equals mc squared, energy out. So we started doing our experiments, getting better and better at them. And by 2012, we were 10x from where we needed to be. We needed 10x more energy that we had to get into the fuel to initiate those fusions. And where are we today? Well, we're only about three times away from where we need to be. So if this mountain is 1,000 feet tall, before the NIF was built, we were standing at the bottom. In 2009, we only had 100 feet left to go. In 2012, we had 10 feet left to go. And now we're really, really close. We only have three feet left to go. But the top of the mountain is covered in clouds. We can't really see it. And we know it's a really steep climb. And we don't know exactly what path to take, right? So we have to try out little things. And all we can do is take one little step at a time. Now, uh, recently, uh, in about 2013, we actually had a nice achievement called alpha heating. What that meant was we were able to start enough fusion reactions and hold that star together long enough um, that the helium that we were creating by fusing that deuterium tritium, that helium could get trapped and redeposit its energy in the fuel. And by that, we could double the number of fusion reactions we had started. So this was a big achievement for us. But really, this is the goal, ignition. The top of the mountain e equals mc squared, more energy out than we put in. Now, when we did hit that alpha heating, when we actually did manage to, to demonstrate fuel gain, so fuel gain was more energy out of the fuel than we put in, not more energy from the lasers, so we still have quite a few steps to go. Um, but when we achieved that, uh, we wrote up a journal article in Nature, and scientists, when we want to share our discoveries with the world, will publish in a journal, and Nature is a pretty prestigious one. Um, this was a really exciting day in fusion research, and you can see it was picked up by international media, and they were really excited too. Uh, fusion energy breakthrough with Star is Born. Um, and this is true, it was the first time 
in nuclear fusion research um, in 60, 70 years that we had been able to demonstrate this. So I'll leave you with this, that achieving ignition on the NIF will bring us closer to harnessing the energy of the sun and the stars to meet the Earth's energy needs. Thank you so much.